Thank you to our show sponsors, FMC Preschool, Canola Master, and Adama Canada. By listening to you and remaining unapologetically crop protection, we leverage the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative solutions to your greatest challenges. Tell your Adama sales rep what you're looking for today. Uh, hello and welcome everyone happy 2023 um yes we've had thank you to everyone for being here and sticking with us uh my producer jay strovey is in saskatoon uh for crop production show he is uh he is hosting this from the hotel there and yes we had a few technical issues um although yes john you're right i can't tell time um so perhaps it's all my fault i don't know um but but warren uh, welcome here, Farmer Schneck. Uh, it's not Chad's cell phone, the brick cell phone, which we are probably <laughs> going to talk about. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so good times. Anyway, thank you everyone for joining us. Yes, it is the first show of 2023. Wonderful to have you uh, here with us. Super excited about uh, tonight's show. We're going to be talking about planning for profitability. Of course, if you collect those CEU credits, please make sure you head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow. Let us know you watch the episode um, and make sure you get those CEUs. And um, as everyone has, which is great, make yourselves at home, ask us some questions. Um, really excited to have my guests on tonight to talk about this. So make sure uh, you do get those questions in. Comment early and often, let's put it that way. All right, so tonight's discussion. Uh, super excited. We're going to talk about profitability with a bit, I, I won't lie, we're going to have a bit of a tip of the hat to rotation. That's going to be the underlying theme. And so joining me for tonight's program uh, from Saskatchewan, from Saskatoon as well, for tonight anyway, is Edgar Hammermeister. Um, and from Lambton County, Chad Anderson. Welcome here, Edgar and Chad. Hello. Good evening. Glad to be here. All right. Okay, so for many of you in the West, of course, you'd recognize Edgar um, and, and Chad, your phone uh, precedes you, I suppose. So Warren, yeah. Warren has let me know um, about that. Okay, so Chad, quickly, when I reached out to you to invite you to the show, your email address is your fourth man. What on earth does it mean to be the fourth man in agronomy services? What does that mean? Oh, it's, that's a bit of a story. I, uh, um, it was late. Um, it was the late nineties in my agriculture uh, career. I was at the ag retail. I was in ag retail at the time and a real, a real true mentor of mine, uh, worked for a large seed company and he'd come courting me to be a dealer. And, um, he said, Chad, he said, you know, after all the, the husband, uh, all the, all the all the sales pitches and stuff he says chad a farmer will look to four people to make a decision one may be a peer one might be uh his uh his uh, his retail outlet his seed supplier a lawyer accountant whoever he says and he says it should be your job to be one of those four people and so that's where i come up with your fourth man i really impressed him when i that's my slogan for my I like it today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I like it a lot. Um, we actually, so um, yeah, Warren says can't hear chat anymore, but uh, John can, I can, Edgar, I think you can too. Um, never mind, Warren. Uh, yeah, that's maybe just the internet gremlins getting back at you. All right, so Edgar, for those uh, of our audience who don't know you, um, why don't you tell us a bit about what you do in Saskatchewan and uh, of course with Western Ag Labs as well. So yeah, well, I'm live in deep southeast Saskatchewan, about 20 minutes from North Dakota, about 45 minutes from Manitoba, town of Alameda, and uh, we're in the map of Saskatchewan, two and a half hours southeast of Regina. Down at Alameda, I manage a 4,000 acre farm, uh, working with my family, but uh, that's this kind of the summer season. But in the uh, the non-growing season, I'm um, involved with Western Ag Professional Agronomy, providing crop planning services uh, for area farmers. I work in the Southeast, but I'm a technical support for the agronomists uh, in the rest of the Western Ag team uh, working across the prairies. Okay, all right. So it gives us a, so Chad, you are the fourth man on the farm 
Edgar's helping out in Saskatchewan, all over Saskatchewan, and of course on the farm at home. Tonight we want to talk about planning for profitability. So I always like to think of uh, this time of year as being, you know, where you really start to solidify some of those plans for the year. Hopefully a lot of planning has happened before now. But Chad, I'll go to you first. When you're working with your clients and you're trying to hammer out the plan for the year, what is the first sort of piece of information that you start with when trying to put all the pieces together? Well, so where, where I work and in, um, in, in Lambton County here, it's, it's, it's predominantly in the Southern part of the County, which is a high, really high clay content soil. Um, we're very heavy to uh, soybeans and rotation. And uh, so really we're trying to, maximize our rotation with the challenge of trying to grow way too many soybeans. Um, so um, in terms of planning, it's really we're looking at previous crop, um, what, what, uh, and what, what outcomes are going to come in terms of what we did last fall. Um, but we, we try and, we try and look to the rotation to, to determine our, our, our planning. Yeah. When you say way too many soybeans, which I completely agree with, and I don't even know how many that is, um, but how much of a challenge is it to kind of work in some diversity into the rotations in your area? It's become it's it's become easier over the years. Um, we've really made tremendous strides in in uh, field drainage. Um, I think really since the commodity boom started in 2005, I guess, we've seen a lot more field drainage go in. And that's really up until then was our biggest challenge was, was drainage, mm -hmm. which really led you to grow soybeans, right? We were always a, a delay, a more we could really suffer from delayed planting. So, and because mm -hmm. you know, corn can go south pretty hurry on the clay. So if it, if it didn't take much of a reason to switch from corn to so soybeans, and then if we got late in, in the season, then our, of course our planting of wheat in the fall was late, which would lead to uh, mm -hmm. poor winter survival. But uh, today we can, we can do much better. You know, we're starting to grow a little bit of winter canola now, which was, uh, oh, the last time we tried that was about 15 years ago. But no. uh, um, it's, it's gained a little bit of traction. Uh, but really, it's it's the investments that have been made in field tile that, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're pretty much, you know, pretty much gone all systematic. There's still random tiled farms, very few non tiled farms anymore. But it's mm -hmm. that's that's really been our the big the biggest change, I think, in my in my career anyway, has been how much we've improved the drainage. I like how you bring up sort of that cascading discussion of you get delayed. So then the beans go in, the beans went in late, so you can't get them off in time. So then the wheat doesn't go in in time, then it doesn't do as well. And then it comes, it's not in rotation either because you have to take it out or it fails. Um, yeah. So that is part of what tonight. And so for everyone watching and for our, our guests tonight, one of the things I want to talk about is putting all these puzzle pieces together um, for that profitability piece. And I don't want to, and Edgar, I'll go to, go to you next. Do you start with yield? Because I don't want to make this all about top yields because we know that top yield isn't always the most profitable. But when you're planning on your own farm or perhaps advising with clients, do, do you want to start with your yield goal or where do you start? Well, first of all, with our process, we don't talk about a yield goal. We, what's, what's, we look at what's the potential of the land. And so it's a little different mindset because uh, farmers could have a paradigm of thinking about what, what the their goal is, but if the land isn't capable of doing that, then you're a wasted effort, wasted economics. So we, we focus on what, optimizing the yield potential for a given field. The, uh, but the, the first thing, um, I guess for the, for the farms that I work with, uh, quite a large number of them, um, but the, the guys are by and large, it's talking about what's next in the rotation and uh, trying to alternate. I um, 
preach hard about a, a four-year rotation, not that everybody follows it, um, but everybody gets reminded about the implications of, of deviating and, uh, and working toward um, uh, an extended rotation. And it's uh, understanding, I guess, as we look at what's going on, um, it's understanding what the potential of the soil is, what the, the nutrient supply power is. And then uh, sometimes there's adjustments um, between, you know, could the field be soybeans or could the field be canola based on nitrogen supply rate. And if there's a, a very strong supply rate, well, we can make the adjustment and, and put canola in um, and put the soybeans or pulses, the peas or lentils on a, on a lower nitrogen uh, field. And if the farmer is generally good with his rotation, it gives him the flexibility for the one-off to switch things up when we have an unusual year. Right. It adds that bit of a cushion, right? So, okay. So John, exactly. John's got a question here, Chad. Um, is or was part of the winter survival issue in South Lambton due to lack of snow cover um, in that, I mean, snow cover obviously plays a huge role. But really, it's how the winter wheat crop goes into dormancy and into winter. Um, so, what is your what is your thought? Is it the lack of snow cover that really gets you? Uh, no, our biggest challenge is is the freeze thaw cycle. So, if we and it, and that really goes back to our planting date. So, or we, unless we get a really open fall, you know, we have to get the plants rooted. Um, Mm -hmm. to to be able to uh to to be able to take that uh free freeze thaw action and in, in you know mostly in march that's that's when we lose our wheat crop the other the other place mm -hmm. we lose it is is just excess of water and drowning so yeah. um we have like here in lambton county in the last number of years there's i, I haven't pushed snow here if you if you're patient enough long enough it'll it'll melt away before you have to <laughs> clear the driveway so yeah no it's it's really mm -hmm. and it you know again it's these it's these wet clay soils that really are are really prone to that heaving so yeah. um you know you mentioned the cascading effect like so here we you know we make excuses to grow soybeans on soybeans um but off and and there's and there's got there's a group of farmers who don't choose to grow corn um and so they, they look for a rotation that's soybeans, soybeans, wheat. And, um, and what happens is the, what often happens is, is, you know, those, the second year beans, we even have a phrase for it. We call it base bean ground. Um, it comes early first because there's not much residue and it's, it's the first to plant. Mm -hmm. So it tend, we often tend to have to replant them. And uh, so we plant early and we plant often and uh, then uh, we replant those. And then so that makes the wheat planting late because you got to put the wheat after your second year beans, not your first year beans. Mm -hmm. And so then the wheat okay. doesn't survive well. So you put it back to wheat and then you just keep going until you, you keep a poor crop of wheat and you complain you can't keep it, make money at wheat anymore. So Right. Yeah. But then we had this spring that just came and now I'm not not sure how averages went in your area but just before we broke for the holidays we did talk about the 2022 wheat yields and going into winter the wheat looked awful and coming out of winter it didn't look perfect and it still ended up doing really well so if you can stomach looking at a really terrible looking winter wheat crop maybe every once in a while you could bring it to yield maybe yeah, yeah maybe um yeah. okay uh, John, I'll get to your comment in a minute, but uh, Warren Schneckenberger wants to know, Edgar, what four crops would you typically, when you say a four crop rotation or a four year rotation, what is the most typical of that sort of the four crops or the four year rotation? Well, the, the most typical, and we'll start with canola because that's the, the money maker that everybody focuses on, but it'll be canola, um, cereal, which could be wheat, barley. There's a rare individual that does do winter wheat on the canola stubble. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, then we do a pulse and then back to a cereal. Um, and what, what I'm looking to do on my farm is to, uh, on the year of pulse, and it, it's a little bit related to um, trying to manage against the, the establishment of a phanomyces, but uh, every second go around, so it, 
oh, I'll, I'll do it this way. 25% of the farm is canola, 50% is cereals, 12.5% is flax, 12.5% pulse. And on a, a rotation basis, that makes pulses once every eight years, which, although I don't have a phenomyces on my land, but it, it'll minimize its, its uh, mm -hmm. development on the land. Mm -hmm. uh, Warren, very much tongue in cheek, suggests canola, 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 soybeans would be the four year <laughs> rotation. <laughs> so, so there you go. Um, yeah, well, there are also those that, you know, yes, also do the canola snow, canola snow. That's their, yes. um, all they're going to do. But uh, interesting that you have flax in the mix. We could, we could do a whole other conversation on that, but we're not going to just yet um, because we have a whole bunch of other things to talk about. But it is interesting to me to have seen the flax acres sort of move out of Manitoba and into Saskatchewan years ago. Um, and there, there is certainly still that, you know, set number of flax acres, but it's one of those ones that kind of can go all over the map. Um, so interesting to see it sort of in there. Um, okay, so John is back to this sort of the freeze-thaw cycle as well. And Chad, as you mentioned, it's that heaving of those heavy clays for sure that is going to uproot that crop and make it vulnerable and, and make it vulnerable in the spring. Um, this winter, I have to say we had, so I'm just west of Ottawa. Uh, we, I have seen a, a tremendous amount of winter cereals go in, of winter wheat go in. Um, and we right now have almost no snow cover, which again, maybe not the worst, uh, but we had those crazy warm days and then the cool down. Chad, that's maybe more usual for where you are, is that maybe it doesn't get as cold, but you get those those warm ups and cool down. But as you've mentioned, it's standing water that is going to be more detrimental than exposed plants. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, except you no know, water on the clay. Excess water is always our enemy. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, so, uh, yeah. or sorry, go ahead. Oh, that was that's got me. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I want to, and Edgar has sort of touched on it, but one of the reasons I want to talk about rotate or set the scene here with rotation and the things that come in is, and you've mentioned it, it's diseases. Um, I want, I do want to talk about how um, a diverse rotation or a less than diverse rotation, how that increases. So which perhaps pests are you most concerned about? So Chad, maybe I'll start with you uh, with too many soybeans in rotation. Um, what what are you most concerned about? What do you fight the most on the pest front? So disease, weeds, or insects? Uh, so, you know, and we, you know, in our industry, we're good at finding band aids, right? So soybean cyst nematode was probably the biggest challenge for the longest time. Genetics have solved that. Race changes are 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 becoming uh, a lot more in the news. Uh, we're not seeing them here in Lambton yet, but certainly just south of us in Kent County where soybean cyst nematode was first found. They, they've been, they've been struggling with uh, the race change now for, oh, I bet you it's pretty close to 10 years in isolated situations, but it's getting worse. Uh, Phytophthora root rot um, is, uh, is a really, it's always been a challenge for soybean production here in Ontario. Um, we've had, you know, we've, you know, there's been some good, genetics in terms of field tolerance in terms of uh, the genes for resistance seed treatments have really changed you know there's a new uh, seed treatment from syngenta viantis here last year that looks tremendous for phytophthora um so you know those are the two biggest pests in terms of soybeans i think the other one that we often forget about though outside of disease is weed pressure and um the ability to rotate crops also gives you the chance to rotate your your herbicides your herbicide groups we've just started to see water hemp here the last two seasons um it is you know we've been dealing with flea bane for a long time glyphosate resistant flea bane um, right here i'm outside of brigden and you know we used to be pretty proud because all the group two weeds were always found first here in Brigden because we used, so we just kept using group twos in the nineties. So we found them all there, but, um, you know, so we've been dealing with flea bane for a while, but, uh, water hemp for me is it's unbelievable. It's a, it's like a, the Arnold Schwarzenegger of weeds. Like it's just a monster. Um, mm -hmm. so we need to rotate our chemistries, um, to, uh, 
to stay ahead of it. It's it's a it's a terrible weed. Yeah. I'm glad you call so, it a monster. Yeah. I, yeah. I really did because in a couple weeks, so this is a quick segue. Uh, so on January 23rd, so in two weeks from now, I have Dr. Charles Geddes and Dr. Francois Tardif joining me on the show and we're going to talk about monsters. So exactly as you mentioned, the water hemp, um, the koshas, the palmer amaranth, all uh, the fleabane, all the fun ones. Anyway, yeah. and I use yeah, that word lightly. Um, okay, so Edgar, we we have a lot to talk about um as well on the phantom ic's club route we've got some things that we'll bring in but um are those for you the top two diseases that you are focused on in your rotation as far as rotation having an impact on well fortunately in in southeast saskatchewan we are not seeing club route that we're aware of. There's been no reports of it. Um, but it's one that I'm, I guess, very sensitive to in, in that we, we just don't want it to show up. Um, the, the disease that is prevalent for the pulses is the phantomyces. And un unfortunately, there's, I have uh, some new customers um, and a number of acquaintances that just cannot grow pulses anymore because the phantomyces mm -hmm. will, will essentially terminate the crop. And, and it's yeah. taken away an option for the farm and and pulses uh, can well they can be a, a very profitable crop in in a lot of years but also just the benefits to to the soil and the following crops to having a pulse in mm -hmm. rotation um, where I am uh, I was really hoping that soybeans would be able to uh, to have a, a gain a foothold but where uh, I guess where I farm and uh, a lot of my, my customers were in the, the dark brown soil zone. And that's where well, I, I can literally see the black soil zone from my living room window. And, um, and that's a big teaser because some years you'll wish you would have grown soybeans because you had August moisture. And then the year that you do, it's a dry August and, and the, the yields fizzle. And so uh, where there was a lot of interest in soybeans, and it would have been absolutely wonderful for crop rotation to help guys extend the rotation. But the economics are, are a struggle most years. And so the, the acres mm -hmm. have, have eroded because of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. One thing All right. Well, now, wanna, oh, yeah, go I, ahead. I guess I just wanted to dovetail a little bit in what Chad was saying about um, crop rotation and, and herbicide rotation. That That's part of why I like to have as, as much diversity on my farm as I do. In, and I encourage it with my customers is that a, a rotation, a extended rotation forces a herbicide rotation as well. And it's mm -hmm. all, the, the idea of having rotation is all about having flexibility. And, um, and so, and that doesn't mean automatically buying the cheapest herbicide every year, because often that's a similar group and you start selecting hard and, uh, and that ends up getting you into trouble where you're then forced to buy the higher cost products. And so th right. there's years where I will buy the more expensive products and the more inconvenient approach to, to try and do herbicide or weed control, but it's all about mixing in the group three or group eight herbicides to, to help with mm -hmm. uh, the wild oat control. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, I do not have group one wild oats issues on my farm. Um, work hard at trying to do that. But I know in my area, just talking with the local retail, there is a, a it's a big problem. And, and because mm -hmm. guys have lost group one, now they're overusing group two, they're going to lose that tool as well because of overuse. Absolutely. Um, okay. Fantastic. And we've got some great comments coming in, but I do want to just quickly pause um, and make sure that we send a shout out to uh, tonight's show sponsors for making this all happen. A big thank you to our sponsors tonight, Adama Canada, Canola Master and FMC Preschool. Weeds constantly evolve, but so can your integrated pest management strategies. Knowing the latest weed pressures, resistance trends, application techniques, management strategies, herbicide science, and more gives you tools for a proactive, agronomically responsible response. 
Go to www.fmcpreschool.com for recorded webinars from field experts and curated articles. fmcpreschool.com, your knowledge, your business, your success. Okay, so we do have some great comments having rolled in. Um, many of them are about mother-in-laws and I'm gonna leave those ones alone. Um, <laughs> however, John does ask, so Chad, uh, this one for you, but of course anyone um, in the comments, if you've got uh, anything to weigh in on here, water hemp, as far as where water hemp has been found, um, if you happen to know off the top of your head, just the range, I think John, um, I can't do it right now, but I do think we've posted a map or two on realagriculture.com uh, a time or two when we've had um, some of the reports that come out about where we find it. Because I know uh, Dr. Peter Sikma has done some pretty extensive work on where it all is. Um, it's in a lot of places, John, I'll put it that way. But Chad, do you have any idea just how widespread it is at this point? Uh, oh, it's, it's terribly widespread and I can't, I, I can't off the top of my head mention all the counties but the, the incredible thing about the weed is how quickly we're finding it just gets more and more multiple uh, races so for mm -hmm. for example i found it for the first time two seasons ago and it was the and in so one farm was a new farm a client had bought so no history and it it had quite a bit of water hemp in it um so and just as a sidebar, we went from one field two years ago that we had it in seven fields this year, noticeable. Like, and it's, yep. it's the, the problem is it's it's forever germinating. We had dry weather this year. We didn't get canopy closure. We had latest seeds. But the other field that I found it in two years ago, um, we'd never had it. Um, it was a, it was in a field of uh, uh, sugar beets um, and. Uh, I sent the, the seeds away and I, it was the first group 27 found in Ontario. So we hadn't even experienced it oh, yet. And now we had five, yeah. five way race weeds right in the, yeah. in the field. So it, it's, yeah. it's, it, it's a, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a real concern for uh, sugar beet production because, you know, really now we're just down to group four and for control and, um, there is no, you know, all we can use in sugar beets is copyrolid and copyrolid has no activity on, on the pigweed family. So it's, uh, oh, it's, yeah. it's a tremendous, tremendous challenge for the little bit of sugar beets that are grown in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, Warren does share that, yes, it's been found as far east as uh, Grenville and Stormont. Um, as if I can remember the map correctly, John, it has, it hasn't gone as far north as it has traveled sort of east west if you want to say it that way um but it it is incredibly widespread and it has spread very quickly across the province um and yes the the plants that are showing up already are from a genetic background that have multiple mode of action resistance so they they already are resistant to several different groups so it's it's pretty awful um now okay so let's talk a bit more about so Edgar, you did mention sort of the profitability part of it, the flexibility part, which I really like in keeping a diverse rotation. Um, and so we've got a question here on what do we consider? Now we've used the word sustainable, so we have to qualify that a little bit. But what is the most sustainable rotation for Western Canada? And what would it be for Eastern Canada? And before I go to each of you, Warren says he wants to get to a CCSCSW rotation. And I'm going to say that that's canola. Okay, Warren? It's not corn. It's canola, then corn, soybeans, uh, camelina, then soybeans, then which wheat. I'm just kidding. I'm throwing a whole bunch of things in there. But um, but Edgar, maybe I'll start with you because you've already laid out sort of a four-year rotation is good. But if we are talking about putting a pulse in there, as you said, if you can slide, say, a flax in there or a soybean in there, um, that can extend maybe when you would be putting a pea or a lentil in rotation because of N Aphanomyces. So what do you consider, I guess, a, a solid rotation for for your area anyway? Because obviously Western Canada is a big place. Yeah, well, making the assumption that we don't have the diseases 
in in place then then the four year should or the with the, the canola we peas we barley flax uh, that type it, it basically cereal pulse cereal rotation and the uh, where it, it starts being a challenge is, is when you lose the pulse because of phanomyces well there is some pulse options but it, it, they aren't necessarily all uh, available unless you're wanting to experiment with intercropping chickpeas uh, mm -hmm. to the best of my knowledge are not uh, susceptible to to phanomyces and grow chickpeas in a wetter environment but if you, you need to intercrop them with flax and uh and it really uh uh, for the research that uh, the, the independent research farms have been doing, uh, you can really reduce your disease transmission by commingling flax with your chickpeas. Um, mm -hmm. Soybeans being an option is great if you have August. Otherwise, it's kind of a placeholder break even. Um, and I guess years ago, that's what we used to do was and then grow canola to be to make money. But uh, we've gotten away from that. So, uh, Chad, and I'm going to go to you quickly, but then I am going to go to a video because one of the things that we've sort of, I want to touch on here is, is which crop in the rotation gets credited for making you the extra money? Is it really the money you think, or is it really the crop you make the money on? Or are there added benefits to the other crops in rotation that really should be credited with some of that? So I do want to talk about that. But John just quickly says that he has water hemp, but he wants to know if, um, or so far hasn't been affected by water hemp, but wants to know if it's uh, if there's a way to keep it out, mitigate it. I'm going to tell you, John, just keep scouting, please. Scout a lot. Scout early and often. Um, okay, so Chad, what do you think then? Is a three crop rotation for Ontario the the best we can do or or what we should be aiming for um is a three crop necessary uh what do you think so i had a an old mentor an organic farmer mentor in the 90s told me the perfect rotation has seven crops in it so i uh, i don't know how we get to that but as far as grain and oil seeds you know holding for us in Lambton County, if we can hold to a solid corn, soybean, wheat rotation, we're like a champion in terms of rotations here. Um, I, you know, I mentioned earlier, we're starting to look again at winter canola. We're having, we're having decent success with winter canola. We're finding that we can plant it much earlier than we used to. Um, and if we, that early planting it, just like, you know, and the canola has got like a, a carrot type root like it's tapered so it even he's worse than wheat and that's where we lose it is in that in that freeze thaw if we could if we could ever count on winter canola and rotation and get to that four crops where we had corn soybeans winter wheat winter canola i, I really i'm really excited about that because just our our challenge on the clay is compaction and when we're when you're dealing with winter crops you're doing all your work on those winter crops when the soil is its strongest you know you're planting it in the in, in the driest times of the year we're we're mitigating really mitigating compaction issues um so i i look you know if we can the more we can reduce the frequency of soybeans in our rotations the better off we will be there's some really great work out of woodsley uh, at ag canada um that uh that really that was started it was like a 20 year it's over 20 years now but um it really shows the impact of uh of, uh, as you increase the frequency of soybeans you you lower the yield potential in all your crops you you uh, you lower all the the quality parameters of your soil you know whether it's organic matter carbon uh, respiration mineralization and nitrogen all those things um you know, the sugar, the, the, the solid sugar beet growers in Lambton County are a four crop rotation. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, they, they're planting their, you know, predominantly today we plant um, our sugar beets after winter wheat because that's a lot of work done in Michigan where that's the strongest rotation for, for sugar beets. But then you got to look at that poor crop of corn after them sugar beets. Uh, it can, you know, there's so much 
compaction with sugar beet harvest that it can be a real challenge but yeah mm -hmm. so uh, for, i don't feel so bad for can, the corn can, i'll be honest yeah <laughs> yeah well it's it's when it goes purple it's never fun yeah you, yeah you think you're growing maize again it's yeah yeah it's true um and warren if you were closer i would punch you in the face for suggesting that the best rotation that terry daner dr terry daner shared was corn 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 for about 30 years and then houses that's the most profitable one <laughs> um so i never i don't want to choose violence but today i will choose violence um okay so well, I think, you uh, know, the other thing the other yeah, go th ahead. Lindsay, before we leave you know to to warren's point there when, when we look at continuous cropping whether and that's actually comes out of well in ontario we're really blessed we've got the egg canada work down at, at harrow and woodsley there, mm -hmm. there's the long-term trials at ridgetown and Alora. but what we also know is by rotating crops is that we grow more crops with less inputs right like it's 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 a, it's a wind it's it's the easiest it's the oldest and easiest agronomy rule in the book you know a long diverse rotations lead to more greater profitability and and uh and, you know really buffers buffers a farm economically i like that the oldest the oldest and easiest i would add the next step would be manure and livestock but anyway i'm biased okay so uh producer jay i know that the feed is a little glitchy um we are also somewhat concerned that his laptop may explode trying to run this live stream uh, on the road. But I do want to, as you mentioned, the long-term trials at Ridgetown, uh, we've got a clip here from SWAC from a couple of years ago, back in the before times when it, we had SWAC uh, with Dr. Dave Hooker and Bird Tobin uh, talking about adding wheat into the rotation and the impact on profitability. So producer Jay, if you could roll that clip. <laughs> Hey, I want to talk about um, long-term rotation and tillage trials you've had at Ridgetown here. 25 years, pretty amazing. Um, talk about it, tell us how important it is to study long-term tillage and rotation. Well, of all projects that I do here at Ridgetown, this is my all-time favorite project for a number of reasons. What the main reason is because the results from this project have been at the most important, most relevant to uh, answering the questions that a lot of farmers have on what crop rotations are the best, what tillage systems are the best in order to increase profitability. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the results you've seen over the years and it calls out to me is the role of wheat. When you extend your rotation, corn, soy, wheat, even throw in some red clover, you're looking at some potential, you know, large payback from a bushel perspective. Yeah, that, that's right. And so a crop rotation, if you change a crop rotation, that means we're changing a system a system of variables. And so as soon as we change a system of variables, we really have to take into consideration all the factors that are changing. And then in the system, because when we're thinking about the corn enterprise, we have to also think about, well, what's happened, what would happen to the soybean enterprise if we change something in the corn? Or if we start planting wheat, what will happen in, to the corn and soybean enterprises if we start planting wheat? And so that's really the true value of these long-term trials is that we get to assess or, or determine the responses to other factors or other crops in the rotation. So if we, our research has shown that if we plant wheat in the rotation of a corn soybean wheat rotation, our corn yields are between six and 17 bushel per acre higher if we plant wheat in the rotation compared to just a, a corn soybean rotation. So that is very, incredible in terms of the performance of the corn and soybeans between four and six bushel per acre more if we plant wheat in the rotation. So th that's incredible because if these corn and soybean yield or enterprises are yielding more that means the profitability should be given to the wheat yeah. part, the wheat enterprise. And so this... Peter Johnson would be happy to hear that. That's please. right and he didn't pay me to say this. He doesn't pay me at all. So if the wheat is is enhanced that means that we should give the credit where credit is due and give that credit to the wheat enterprise and this could influence our decision you know should i plant wheat or should i not plant wheat this could uh, move us to the direction that hey wheat is more important than we thought considering other factors in the rotation so much to talk about soil health obviously i want to talk about nitrogen i mean uh, your corn actually does a lot better in a longer rotation because it's utilizing that nitrogen better 
Yes, it's utilizing the nitrogen better, and our data shows that the soil quality is that much better, where wheat is included in the rotation. The soil quality is better, the total nitrogen content of that soil is higher, where we have wheat in the rotation. This is not including red clover yet. And that ability, that, that enhanced nitrogen, better soil structure, uh, probably just enhances the corn rooting depth and scavenging ability of that corn, and so it's more nitrogen efficient. But with wheat in the rotation, we're allowed or it enables us to include, let's say, a red clover cover crop into rotation, and that enables us to grow you know, some of our own nitrogen, which saves our nitrogen costs as well. And if we didn't have wheat in the rotation, if we didn't have wheat in the rotation, we, um, it would be very difficult to, to get, get a, a nitrogen credit from red clover, let's say, in a corn soybean rotation. Oh, and just as I planned, some great questions that have come in. John, you're very chatty today, and I appreciate it a lot. Um, and we've got some uh, some great comments from Kevin out in uh, the BC Fraser Valley as well on how they run some of their rotation. So I'll share that in just a moment. I do want to just quickly get in uh, one last sponsor. Thank you, uh, Producer Jay, if you could do that before we carry on. Our sponsors tonight are Adama Canada, FMC Preschool, and Canola Master. We call ourselves Canola Master because we want every canola grower to achieve growing perfection. Master your canola with the 160 acres of gold giveaway. Enter today at canolamaster.ca. Conditions apply. So good times. Uh, I just had my light just about hit me in the head so this is everything is going great guys everything's fine okay um okay so we have we we have um uh, the last part of the show here to really dig into some of these and we have hit on some of these great questions about profitability um and uh but kevin bishop so canadian cam on shares five years of corn double cropped with winter wheat or ryegrass blend then five years silage uh hay Right or wrong, cows need to be fed. And that's right, he is a dairy farmer. So of course, his rotation is gonna look perhaps a bit different than most of ours on the prairies or in Southern Ontario. Um, Kevin, maybe remind us how many cuts of like alfalfa you would get or forage you would get in a year. I'm thinking it's something like five um, or more. So we just all shake our heads. Um, okay, so here we i do want to edgar you do want to talk about phantomyces i think we should as well but jay if you could bring up here's one of the things i want to talk about with the profitability question um so there is a chart and we've we've shared a chart like this before um sorry not the phantomyces the chart on the crop following crop uh we'll get there don't worry everyone we can do this it's like the first slide one four. so i'm really sorry yes yeah, slide four I'm sorry, Jay. It's, you know what? It's Monday. Leave me alone. Um, we will get there. Uh, so, because one of the questions, there we go. Okay. So this is the, the yield response. And so we know that depending on your province, and I, I really do, I'm not sure that I see an Ontario version of this because it would be a much shorter chart. There'd be like four crops. That's not true. We have edible beans, we have sugar beets, we have oats, we have barley, so it would be a decent size chart. But the, the point is, almost every province, you can find this information where it will show you the previous crop, right, Edgar, am I reading this right? Basically, the previous crop's impact, so the stubble, on the yield potential of the year following. Am I reading it right? You are reading it right. And this, this information comes from Manitoba Agriculture Services Corporation. And to their credit, like they, they do a tremendous amount of summarizing. Uh, and, you know, as in Saskatchewan, to dig real hard to try. Mm -hmm. We'd have to go to the research. But our crop insurance doesn't summarize like this. The thing that we do have to think about looking at this data is that this is all field all the data right. combined we don't know the management around these um these circumstances but looking bridges that where they're highlighted in green is where there's a, a beneficial advantage to the rotation of of that crop grown on that stubble and so it, it's uh you know to look at at this and i've shared this tape my customers many times and just for the, the it emphasizes the the fundamental principle of crop rotation and the benefit 
you're putting all the same effort in and you can get another four or five, six percent yield just because of rotation. And that's that goes purely to bottom line rather than fighting against yeah. what I do for you. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So that brings up and, and John, thank you for reading this up. So two things, one is equipment. Um, and so if you're going to diversify, does that mean you're spending a lot of extra money on equipment? And it, I, I would, we can explore that in a minute, but Chad, one of the other, or so to John's point, if you're going to extend your rotation, um, at the end of the day, though, you've got to pay your bills and we do tend to get hung up, maybe not so much right now or in the past couple of years where crop prices and yields have been good, but often one of the key factors that farmers will say is, you know, I need to be growing the more profitable of my crops more often because I've got to pay my bills. So how do we balance the longer term impact, positive impacts of a diverse rotation with sort of that annual needing to pay our bills kind of thing? No, that, oh. Yeah, go ahead, Chad, and then we'll go to Edgar. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think that's that can be very farm specific, right? Um, you you work on a you work on a legacy of rotation effect too. So if you want to, if you have to cheat a year here or there, um, it, it can happen. You know, this is a you know there's there's different ways to look at it as well. Um, you know, the, the the comment about equipment. For us, if we can grow more winter crops, that it stretches our harvest window out. So we are actually taking workload off of moving it in seasons, so we can we can get more out of our equipment that way, and and not or not need as much equipment to harvest the same amount of acres. Um, the uh, you know this year where we had a really poor winter survival in wheat the past year. The other thing that happened, we you know, we came into these inflated input prices. Um, we didn't have any wheat to harvest. You know, we're, we're I think we were probably around thirty percent of our normal harvested acres. Um, you know, so there goes a whole bunch of summer cash flow, and you know, so now you're now you're running your operating loan through through the fall, um, different things like that. So the, you know. I went to school for economics and you can make a lot of assumptions all along different ways and you can, you can turn math any way you want to, to make it work. And, but we know fundamentally, I, I really, you know, I mentioned the, uh, the, that, uh, uh, that the work in Woodsley, that's an egg Canada study. And it's a really neat, uh, trial or experiment. It's over 20 years long and they've got continuous corn, continuous wheat, continuous soybeans, and then all these myriad of combinations of those, right? And what they found was, so if they, and I only, and it's Woods League, I like it because it's it's a clay, it's a clay site. Um, I only really concentrate on the soybean data, but, you know, so they took continuous soybeans and then and compared it to a three crop rotation. Over those 20 years, the soybeans averaged continuous soybeans were just over 40 bushels to the acre. The three crop rotation was just over 60 bushels an acre. Like it's 50%, right? Like how, like what else, what else can you do on your farm to get a 50% yield increase? Right. And it's, and, and it's, um, and it, it's all the way through. I think if the, so they went, they, tr the, there was the alternation. So corn beans or, or wheat and beans right back and forth. Um, by simply doing that, I think their yields went up uh, forty percent on the soybeans. Um, you know, and, but yet if they went, if they added another crop of beans in there, so let's say they go corn, beans, beans, the the bean yields was only up twenty six percent over continuous beans. Like so, yeah, you give them I, I, I hear, I hear, I hear. You need to to make money, but if you're gonna if you're gonna get the most out of your farm, and that's by producing bushels. You've got to you've got to set the stage to put and, and this chart that that we got here and all that just shows you like it, it's what you do to, that that ten percent yield advantage doesn't cost anything right it's 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 inherently built in and I think the other thing if you pick it up out of um, at a Dave's presentation there at a uh, out of his work in Ridgetown is the bottom isn't as bad right you know, when you know when if yeah. you are stuck in a poor rotation. And, and things go against you. And even even the die hard um, soybean 
growers in Lambton County this year with the drought that we had said, oh God, I got too many soybeans in rotation when they were pulling off 25 bushel beans and their neighbor on well-rotated soils was doing 40. It wasn't a great year, but is mm -hmm. you know that's quite a difference in just from rotation. It adds that resiliency, I think. So yeah. um, the the other the other point, and and so John, to make this clear, I think too is is a diverse rotation is somewhat relative. So for Ontario, a lot of the work, exactly as Chad has related, has looked at the difference between essentially only corn and soy and adding wheat, or adding wheat and then red clover. It's just adding that third crop, just making sure that you're using a three crop rotation is really, that is considered diverse for Ontario and carries with it some significant benefits. So um, it, I mean, sure, if you've so inclined to add other ones, like realistically, like a chart like this would show, or if you dig into the data, there's all sorts of other potential advantages as well. But I think really just speaks volumes as to the importance of keeping at least those three uh, pretty close in rotation as well. Um, uh, Greg asking about, is it ever bad to grow more grain corn? Um, it's limited is more about spreading out workload. I would say yes, except for we are also running into some resistance issues uh, with some of our pest species and some of our traits in corn as well. So um, we really have to think about that's maybe less so grain corn, uh, maybe more of an issue for the silage growers that tend to go back to back. But we do have to think about um, the cumulative effect of either traits, and Edgar, we can talk about this as well, uh, traits wearing out way too quickly uh, because we put them under too much pressure, weeds evolving way too quickly because we put them under too much pressure, um, all of those things. So, and this is one of the things I think we have to as an industry remember, we are the ones that decide for the most part what that pressure is going to be as far as the herbicide selection or the trait use. We are the ones that steward that. We can't control the weather, but we can control our rotation and we can control what we apply. And we are getting caught up um, from not making maybe the most diverse decisions and sticking with what we should be doing. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit. Having said that, or Edgar, love to get your thoughts on that too. Um, Jason vote out of Manitoba says just, in Western Canada, what's the best additional crop to add to canola and wheat? That is a loaded question. Okay, Edgar, go ahead. Well, it, you know, for, for Jason, it, it's, uh, and, and Manitoba has the opportunity to grow more consistent because you get, typically can have the aug aside the last couple of years, the, uh, with, with the dry, dry summers. The, um, but it, it's, uh, I just want to, uh, hello, Ray. Um, he's got the comment there. Rotations rule, but all change. It all changes if you're renting the land. I think that's where land uh, the the farmers need to have conversations with the landlords. That really, to you know, to protect the asset. That uh, to help explain mm -hmm. because some of these um, are getting to be more the generations away from the farm. They don't understand the agronomy. And I think that's for, for the farmer to invite their agronomist along to try and encourage uh, and help the, the landlord understand by by easing up on some of the, the rent considerations that but to allow for crop rotation that it, it's for everybody's well the asset is protected. It it's because we've got in Saskatchewan, there's large tracts that just can't grow lentils. In in Western Saskatchewan, derm lentils, derm lentils, derm lentils. It's a thought. Well, the lentils just don't do that well when when it's wet out. And um, maybe Jay, you could bring up. This is where Aphanomyces got started, and and people really didn't understand what was going on is just uh, there, there happened to be a series of some wet years where uh, and, and people just blamed it well is it too wet we just too wet and the 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 disease was well established before uh, mm -hmm. that before we really understood what was going on and then it was too late because the phenomyces like they, they were hoping that if maybe we go to one and six year rotation um, but farmers who've tried that and if it happened to be anywhere close to a moist year they lost the lentil crop 
or, or a large percentage mm -hmm. of it again. So now they're experimenting with eight years. And anecdotally, I heard this year that guys who were eight years out of peas, and it happened to be in June, or a large percentage of it again, making the field not profit. So you've lost mm -hmm. the option. And for a landlord, land just economically can't generate as much profit. You can't you can't reasonably charge as much rent for it. And so the nation that could be had and should be had. And and so I a fan of my sees is one that got away from us that we uh, that we don't understand or it 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 got going before we uh, understood but maybe to uh, to club root um can't remember what slide that one was jay but uh slide 12 this one and this was a western producer article that i had to scrape this one up for a presentation that i did but this is yeah, all just, the way well, hang on one second go ahead hang on Edgar. i just want to state for the record um that we should have redacted where it was from so just you oh. know okay carrying on just <laughs> okay. in case sean watches this he knows that i would have redacted it yeah anyway i'm just kidding mostly but carrying on no this is especially from, when you from, look at the uh, year i find this really fascinating so in western yeah, canada but here's the headline bear laments club in 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 the write-up it's an executive at the world's largest canola company says an unfortunate consequence of developing club root resistant varieties is that growers have come to depend on them too much and that scared me for for the people who have knowledge about what this disease is all about and they're worried about the tool that they're developing because they know what farmers are going to do with it. And we've done it with herbicides. We've done it with our pulse rotation. Now we've got this risk of, of club root. And the, the first go around with uh, the, the club root resistance gene, like it broke down in, in three years in, in Alberta. And it's just mm -hmm. a, a side story. I happened to be at uh, Lakeland College doing, uh, working with the students up there. And they have, in March, they have a big presence about how they're managing their their pl the plans and i happen to have uh, some parents from from uh, westlock area and i had remembered that that spring like there or that year that there's a farmer from had um that their canola their club root resistant canola was no longer fighting the disease that he lost the field to club root and then it was revealed in the article that he had grown club root resistant canola the same variety in a field that's got club root three years in a row and i made the comment that you know the neighbor should have took the guy out behind the woodshed and given him a what for and it got real quiet and then the, the farmer sheepishly said well that wasn't me but I have to admit I'm doing the same thing. Well, I, I guess you know how I feel about it. And the rest of the evening was quiet. Like there wasn't a lot of conversation. But it, it's we're you know that, that like <laughs> so, yes, we can economics hard. Um, we we can push economics hard, but it, it there's going to be a fallacy. Mother Nature will catch up to us on it. Right. So, and I'm not sure if it's working. Your feed is a bit glitchy for me, Edgar, but I, my hat goes off to you for actually saying, and again, twice in one episode, we're choosing violence. But I think in this case, I feel, <laughs> I feel like um, these are some of the hard discussions to have. Um, and you're exactly right. And so now for, for our Eastern friends who don't have club root, so club root is a, is a, a soil borne uh, disease of canola. Um, and aphanomyces as well is a is is a yeah, just awful disease, yeah, of pulses as well. And it basically, as you mentioned, it can completely eliminate a field's eligi eligibility um, to grow pulses, which are one of you know, especially in Saskatchewan, a, a money maker. And so there, they are excellent examples of what can happen, um, you know, through 
I mean, the advent of the disease coming in, and we have, of course, in Ontario, we've got soybean cyst nematode. Now we've got some of these monster weeds coming in. You know, it may not be a farmer's fault that they show up, but what we do with the traits, what we do with the tools that we have, what we do with our rotation can have a significant impact of of what we can do about these longer term. And I think, um, you know, tonight, that's one of the things I really wanted to hit on. So we've got some really great examples of exactly that. Um, and 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 Chad, I really do appreciate the discussion on on the working the profitability in as well, because we really do have to be thinking dollars and cents at all times. Um, but we have to think bigger picture than just maybe uh, the next year for sure. Um, John did mention that he's I working would, to get uh, more hay oh, or more. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to I was just going to add Lindsay to Jason's comment around rent. Uh, in, in that rent cycle. Um, I think the one thing that I've seen in my career that I'm, you know, uh, uh, that I think is a positive, you know, renting, uh, you know, farm, farms are getting larger. Uh, that that usually means more rented land in their portfolio. So it, it, I think it's just an evolution of, of farming here in Ontario anyways. But what I see is a lot more uh, share, at least for the people I work for, is a lot more share crop arrangements versus mm -hmm. just straight cash rent. And under those share crop arrangements, there is an incentive for production, right? Your 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 landowner is going to get bushels, not dollars. He's got to he's gonna he's gonna take that and put it into cryptocurrency or whatever. But um, the um, I see I see a lot of farmers now under that share crop arrangement are willing to invest in the soil, whether that's, you know, brokering in manure, planting cover crops, improving the drainage, all those good things that we know we need to do um, under share crop arrangements happen. They, those things don't happen when you're scared of the next guy coming in and bidding $5 more an acre than you do. So I, I think, I think that's, uh, mm -hmm. I think, I think that's a positive for the industry. Um, to, to Edgar's point about the hard conversations, I, you know, thinking about this talk and stuff, it reminded me of a, uh, at a, uh, of one family I work for, we're both quite involved on our, in our local soil and crop. And here in Lambton County, we're, we're known, we're kind of lazy for, for plots. So we like to do stuff with our sprayers more than anything. So we did a lot of, back in the day, we used to do a lot of fungicide and soybeans and, uh, I remember, oh, it's, we were going through and we had this green, we had this light bulb moment where we saw, you know, all our rotated soybeans had no response to fungicides and we were getting like two or three bushel response on fungicides in the soybeans that were on soybean ground. So the guy said to me, so it's a no brainer. We'll just spray all our second year beans. And I said, well, why not just not plant any second year beans? And then he was quiet. So, yeah, you got to. The band-aids are there, right? But they but they catch up with us. And you know, if we go back to the old simple rules, we can we can manage things a lot better. I really like that both of you say the thing that quiets the whole room and makes everybody go, hmm. <laughs> Um, yeah, so now we have no, run out of just time. Bored. This hour has <laughs> absolutely Yeah, there you go. <laughs> this hour has flown by. Um I love that we got into crypto, um, although Ray DeBanco says uh, I should start sheep coin or something like that. Um, so I'm going to work on that. I absolutely, yeah, I'm going to try. All right. So I will, um, we're going to wrap it up for tonight. Of course, thank you to our show sponsors uh, for making uh, tonight happen. Thank you, Edgar, for taking time out of Crop Production Week for being here with us. Thank you, Chad, for learning a new technology and being so. And I, I'm glad I got to introduce you to each other as well. Um, and thank you to producer Jay for, um, even while on the road, producing the show and his laptop may not survive. So thank you to both of you. And uh, next week, we're going to talk loving your soil microbes. So join me again, 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, right here on The Agronomists. All right. Thanks, gents. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.